Hello, my dear students. I hope all of you are doing well. So today again we are going to look into uh, the John Burnside poem, which is called Penitence. I have told you in the last class this is about an accident involving a car. The poet was driving through a forest and a deer that was crossing his path. So I will read this poem once. So before that, when you watch a, a Tom and Jerry cartoon. Sometimes, uh, Tom, the cartoon character Tom, would take off his cat suit clothes and underneath uh, visible would be socks and inner clothes. So the point is that we think even of an animal as a human wearing animal suits. We don't think a cat is something radically different from us. Tom, the cat, is an entity radically different from us. All we can think of is that it's a human wearing an animal costume. The same goes for circus animals. The same goes for animals in the zoo. So we are constantly anthropomorphizing things. We give everything uh, the spirit of the human. Okay, planets, satellites, uh, material things, non-moving things, uh, living things, lifeless things, lifeless things. Everything is given uh, the uh, quality of life by uh, human life by us. But animals have different uh, qualities. They have this uh, animalness. Okay, so we have to take that into consideration. This is called zoomorphic. You turn into an animal. For example, in George Orwell's novel, 1984, at the end of the novel, you have, uh, you know, you don't know which is which. Okay, the animals uh, become human, the humans become animal. You don't uh, uh, distinguish between the, the one from the other. So, uh, this is zoomorphism. Uh, so, this happens uh, in vampire movies. This ha happens in similar other instances. Like, for instance, in Franz Kafka's very famous novel, uh, The Metamorphosis. Gregor Samsa woke up one fine morning and discovered that he had turned into a gigantic moth. A man turning into a moth. And Kafka brilliantly captures the specificities, the micro nature of being moths. He's not anthropomorphizing the moth as a human. No. Uh, Gregor Samsa turns into a moth. His feelings, his emotions, his being is not those of a human being but those of a moth. I hope you understand. Tom and Jerry cartoon carnival chalapol Tom Aru Pucha Kupayam Uri Matu. Apol Ulil Namaka Soksu Matin Kana Gari. Ada Uri Pucha Kupayam Thericha Manishina Tanamal uh Tom in Elam Rangalim. Mirga Kupayam Thericha humans. That's how we see animals. We anthropomorphize all animals, all life. Even uh, non living things are anthropomorphized by humans. But we have to understand the radical alterity of animal life, zoomorphism. Okay. So, in this particular, how you turn into an animal. Okay. Uh, like in a vampire film, or like, like in metamorphosis, or like in animal farm. How. Uh, the animal is accepted, is imbued with all its specificities, with all its radical alterities. So, I will read the poem once. Penitence. I was driving into the wind on a northern road, the redwoods swaying around me like a black ocean. Okay. This is the uh, beginning. The point is um, driving along the road. There is the primordial forest all around him. He is on the narrow road to the deep north. I drifted off. The poet was feeling sleepy or he was, you know, uh, on a detour. He didn't see the deer till it bounced away, the back legs swinging back outwards as it braked. Uh, please mind the spelling of, of break. It's not B-R-E-A-K, it's B-R-A-K-E. So, uh, the deer, a very graceful animal, it came and hit the bonnet of the car the poet was driving and it bounced off the bonnet. It was not sucked inside the vehicle but it was not sucked beneath the vehicle but it was bumped away thrown by the vehicle and the impact of it so the momentum threw the animal and the poet braked his vehicle and he swerved into the curb into the sleeve of the uh, forest road on the sides of the road you have a curb right you have the footpath so the forest road also has some kind of a sleeve some kind of a verge and the poet swerved huh? His car, he made this very sudden movement of his car by turning the steering and so the, he negotiated uh, the car towards the verge, knowingly or unknowingly. 
Soon as I stopped, the headlamps filled with moths. These tiny creatures, flying creatures, came and filled the headlamps of his vehicle as soon as it stopped. And something beyond the tree was tuning in. Some kind of primordial, ancient kind of sensuous intelligence was kind of monitoring him. It was kind of observing him. It was watching him. Like a CCTV camera in an urban environment, a primordial spirit was looking at him from deep inside the forest. He could not see it, but he could sense it. The throbbing, pulsating spirit of the ancient forest. A hard attention boring through the flesh. To stop the bond that shudder took so long. Not out of fear, but out of that sensation of the forest gazing at him. Boring into his bond, the poet shuddered. He deeply shuddered. He writhed momentarily. To end, I thought the animal had slipped beneath the wheels and lay there quivering. At first, he was dreading that the animal had been crushed under the wheels. Thankfully, it had not happened, but the poet was imagining that. That the uh, deer had been sucked under the vehicle and it was still lying the right thing trampling beneath the vehicle. I left the engine running, stepped outside. He did not cut the engine. He kept it running and he opened the door and he stepped outside. Away at the edge of the light, a body shifted among the leaves. So parts of the forest um, were now being illuminated by the light emanating from the headlamps of the vehicle the poet was driving. But from beyond the limits of that illumination, the poet could see an outline of a form escaping, jumping, shifting, moving, fleeting through the leaves in the forest. And I wanted to go to help, to make it well. Of course, it was the injured animal. He doesn't know, is it injured or is it living or is it dead? Of course, it's alive, but he doesn't know the extent of the injuries the animal had suffered. Let's hope, the poet does hope that the animal was totally unharmed, unhurt. But he really, from all his heart, he wants to go and help the animal and heal it and make it well. But every step I took pushed it away. With each step, the animal was, you know, retreating farther and farther away into the deep forest. Or no, that is not the truth. Here the poet makes a kumbasaram or a confession. Sorry guys, that was not the truth. I did not really want to go there and help the animal. For all the truths, that's not the entire truth, that's only the partial truth. What is the complete truth? Now if I admit my own fear held me back. I was held in a stasis by fear. I could not move. I was not dynamic. I was not rushing forward because of my fear. Not a normal base fear, but a deeper fear. A deeper uh, fear from the core, a shuddering fear of the forest spirit of the alterity of the animal. This is a being radically different from me. That zoomorphic animalness of the deer was what was scaring the poet. It was not a deer, a human in a deer suit. It was another being. It was another creature. It was another kind of life form that was scaring the poet. Not fear of the dark. Not a fear of the dark. Not a silly fear of the dark forest. Nothing like that. Or that presence bending the trees. Or uh, that forest spirit bending, swaying the trees. He was not scared of these things. Not even fear exactly. You could not even call that emotion fear. But the dread. It was a feeling of dread. Of touching. Of colliding with that pain. Of coming face to face with that uh, throbbing. Uh, you know. Flesh. The throbbing protoplasmic vibrating being. That body of the animal. That was what the poet was dreading. For minutes, then I walked back to the car and drove away. This is a very drastic step. The poet, not only did the poet not go to help the animal, but he also committed the cardinal sin of retreating into his carapace, into his shell, namely his vehicle, and driving away. He committed that at first. Okay. Because of this, not fear, but because of this dread he had of touching that mass of protoplasmic flesh. I want to think that deer survived. The poet wishes that the deer was hale and hearty and it was well. Or if it died, it slipped into the blackness unawares. Or God forbid, if it had indeed died, if it had indeed passed away, then it had done so without suffering too much. It had uh, died without too much of pain or consciousness. 
But now and then I drive up to the woods and park the car. Even today, now very often nowadays, the poet once in a while would drive his vehicle into the deep forest and park the car there. Very strange habit. The headlamps still on and filled with moths. The woods tune in. That same primordial sensation again reaches him. I listen to the night. He uh, uh, cocks his ear and he very microscopically listens to the signals being transmitted from deep inside the forest into his brain. And he hears an echo fading through the trees. Through the echoes, he can sense that slight shrimpling resonance and echo of pattering feet of a deer. My own boat flesh in the body of the deer. The poet has become the deer. The deer is the poet. It's zoomorphism. It's a wonderful instance of zoomorphism. Not an animal as a human, not a cat, uh, not a human in a cat suit, but a human turning into the deer. Okay. My own flesh in the body of the deer. What a deep Advaitic spirit, monistic spirit is that. That deer is me. That my that flesh the deer has, that pulsating, throbbing, vibrating, protoplasmic flesh is my flesh. My own flesh in the body of the deer. There's a form of a deer, but my content, my protoplasm, my cellular life inside another life form. Still resonant, remembered through the vent. Still moving, still echoing, still resonant, still throbbing. Uh, how does he remember this? How does this reach his memory? Through the fender. A fender is what you would call the bumper of a car uh, in the front portion of it that guards it from impact. So that, that's a portion of the car that had come into contact with the deer. So the fender of the vehicle had come into contact with the deer. So through that very uh, machinistic, mechanical appurtenance. The poet, uh, mechanical uh, part, the poet comes, uh, had come into contact with the animal and through that mechanical appurtenance, he still remembers the animal. And not only does he remember the animal, but he becomes one in the animal and he relishes that and he uh, still tries to uh, repeat that experience and he launches himself into the forest every now and then into the forest, deep dark forest in the night in order to reclaim his animal hood. Okay, because he has lost his humanity, but he wants to regain his, he wants to retain his essential animal being. Okay, that he wants to retain. The species being of being a human, of being a man is gone. It's post-human world, but he wants to retain that life, that sentience, that intelligence, that beauty, that agility, that grace of the deer, of uh, the, his own flesh in the form of a deer. He wants to embrace that. Okay. So uh, that's how the poem ends. Okay. So many characters are here. Are here. I would, uh, for instance, um, uh, for starters, let's say the poet, his car and the uh, deer. Like you would say the father, son and Holy Spirit. It's very strange the way the vehicle, whatever vehicle, mobile, uh, the uh, poet is moving in. Uh, functions as some kind of a go-between between between the spirit of the human and the spirit of the animal. The poet becomes a deer. The zoomorphism happens through way of the machine. So we are at the uh, verge of a new industrial revolution happening and uh, artificial intelligence and data science and everything and some people are dreading uh, the advent of the machine age. But still, this very movement of becoming animal, zoomorphism, takes place through the very medium of the machine of the mechanical device so appurtenance namely the fender of a vehicle okay uh, so uh, please uh, write an a paragraph on zoomorphism and uh, its unique features that distinguish it from distinguishes it from anthropomorphism for your class assignment so let's stop today and thank you